Okay, uh, our next speaker uh, is talk, we'll talk about a shared vision, the defense of private property. Dr. Keith D. Malone. I, hello, Keith. Keith is a professor of economics at the University of North Alabama. He received his Ph. degree in economics from the University of Alabama in 2006 with fields of specialization in public economics and applied microeconomics. That's a long word. He's a pretty smart fellow. Keith is a professor of economics at the University of North Alabama and a member of the Economics and Finance Department. And uh, Lee had mentioned too just a little while back he was contacted by the contacted was, was he was recommended by the, to the F, AFOA by the Foundation for Economic Education. So somebody thinks mighty lot of Dr. Malone. So Keith, you get based on forward. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Glad to be here. Good afternoon. Thank you. I brought an exam with me later. They're going to hand it at, at, at the end of my talk. <laughs> no, not really. Uh, I want to thank uh, thank you guys for the invitation to come speak. All right. So one of my favorite things to talk about. I teach freshmen all the way to seniors, and private property rights is one of my favorite things to talk about uh, because of the impact it has on economic development. That's that's one of my Applied microeconomics, that's one of the specialties that we do at uh, the University of North Alabama, is economic development. We have an institute for innovation and economic development that I'm a member of there. Uh, and we do economic development work around the state and sometimes out of the state, uh, if we're lucky enough to, to, uh, to be awarded those contracts. But private property rights are very important to me uh, as, a, as an individual and as an economist. Uh, so I want to take a little time to talk with you guys about that this afternoon. Uh, private property uh, and the ways of the king. Uh, that's the title of the uh, my talk today. I'm going to start out with a little uh, scenario and ask a few questions here. Just what if, right, what if the U.S. government was required to survey your timber? You might want to do something with it. You might want to harvest it. You might want to cut some to build a recreation area. You might want to change the, the way the property that you have. What if before you could do anything, the U.S. government had to come and do a survey and decide whether or not you were allowed to do anything? Well, that, that would be, in my, in my case, I'm not sure that's a good thing. I'm pretty certain it's not a good thing. The survey decides what you can and cannot do with certain trees, and at the end of the day, the U.S. government owns certain trees that they choose. They have a certain setup. If a tree meets certain specifications, they just now, that belongs to them, and you've lost that. They don't pay you for it. It belongs to them. You think, this is the United States. That can't happen. That was one of the key things that led to the American Revolution in 1775. <laughs> oh, there you go. You stole my thought there just for a second. The broad arrow policy. We, that, that has happened here before, not as part of the United States government, but as part of the British government. In 1691, right, the British Navy needs lots of timber and they need big timber. They pass a law that's called the broad arrow policy. And it may be hard to see because of the slides, but basically the king surveyor comes along and they mark the trees with this arrow. Any trees that are marked in that fashion belong to the king. No matter whose property they're on, they belong to the king. You can't cut them. If you do cut them, you're going to be fined and maybe put in prison. All right? So uh, that's in 1691, uh, as colonists like to do. They ignored the law. And the British government let them get away with it for some time uh, because they had other sources of timber uh, to build ships with at that time. 16, well, 1700, we get into the late 1700s going to the, Mer the American Revolution. This becomes a bigger problem. Other sources of timber had dried up. They, those were no longer available. And they started to enforce the rules. Uh, so much so that, every, has everybody heard of the Boston Tea Party? <laughs> Everybody's heard of the Boston Tea Party. Has anybody heard of the Pine Tree Rebellion? In Exeter, New Hampshire, right? Oh, exactly, in New Hampshire. 
So this is actually two years prior to the Boston Tea Party, one of the first open acts of rebellion against the crown is there were some uh, sawmillers and some property owners who took issue with the king's ownership of the trees. They cut them anyway, they refused to pay. They got together and, and it was some of the other townspeople and they ran the marshal and the deputies out of town who were trying to collect the fines. Right? And so that was called the Pine Tree Rebellion. A little bit later during the revolution, we have a pine tree flag that was flown uh, on uh, U.S. warships during the American Revolution, right, as a symbol of this uh, rebellion against the British crown. Right, now I'm going to link back into uh, the, the ways of the king. About 3,000 years ago, uh, the people of Israel did not have a king like people around the, the peoples around them did. And so they asked for a king. And so in 1 Samuel, and that's where the, the title part of the slide comes from, in 1 Samuel chapter 8, we, we find the following. These will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his servants. He will take the men servants and maid servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. And that's 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 11 through 18. So throughout history, private property ownership is something of a... Of a doesn't exist. Right? Private property doesn't exist. Even though you might have something, everything that you have at the end of the day belongs to the king. And so throughout history, we see examples uh, things that kings have done to build up themselves and build up the kingdoms without consideration of the people. So we have pyramids in Egypt, uh, hanging gardens of Babylon, Spartan soldiers. Right? We've all read accounts of Spartan soldiers. Children would be taken from their families as early as seven years old to be trained for war. Right? So throughout history, uh, we've seen this to be true. Now, how does this link into economic development and growth in society? So the next sl slide I have here is looking at economic growth across deep time. Now, obviously, there are no records in minus 5,000 years ago, right? So there's no records. So these are estimates, right? But what we have in the uh, third column there is GDP per person what the average person would expect to live on, essentially, in, in a year's time. So $130. And throughout time, we have 130. The year 1,000, we're up to $165. In 6,000 years, that's very little economic development. By 1,500, we're all the way to $175 per year. Then as we get to 1,800, $250. Well, now we're back to something interesting that had happened between 1500 and 1800. 1776, the colonies declare their independence from Great Britain, and they develop a constitution that seeks to protect freedom of people to do as they see fit. So it's the institution, really, of property rights for the individual at the first time in history. Right? And then we see after 1800, we go from $250 to 2000 is $8,175. So there's a significant amount of growth. For all the, the growth that did not occur between negative 5,000 and the year 1500, we've had significant economic growth in the last 500 years. Uh, this is, uh, one of these days I need to update this table to, to 2017. Uh, this is in a book uh, that I pulled this out of that was published in about 2001 or 2002. 
Uh, so it's going to be higher than $8,000 today. But the important point we see here is that the change in property ownership, if you, if, if you had your property today, your house, the government could come in and take it. What, what incentive do you have to, to make things better if there's some possibility that that's going to be stolen away from you by some government or, or, or king at some later time? There is no incentive. In economics, everything we talk about is based on incentives. When people have the incentive to create things, they create. When they have the incentive to not create things, they, they don't. And we see this throughout history. Up until the American Revolution, there's very little change in economic development. And then we can compare that with all the things that have happened since the American Revolution. All the inventions uh, that have been made. I've got some uh, slides I'll show a little bit later, a few inventors that I put in here. We all have studied history. We know about the shot heard around the world. Uh, as this Constitution is being developed, and as uh, I've got a picture of George Washington here as well uh, at the, uh, uh, one of these surrender ceremonies. Right? Uh, after this time, the Constitution is being developed. Uh, there's a famous economist uh, who is British, by the way, uh, named Adam Smith. We, we consider him to be the father of modern economics. 1776 is an important year in the United States because of the Declaration of Independence. 1776 is also important in the economics field because that was the year that Adam Smith published a book that he called The Wealth of Nations. Right, a book that you may have heard of before. If not, it's about two volumes thick. It takes forever to read. Uh, I haven't read all of it myself. I've read uh, a good portion of it, but not the whole thing. Right? But one of the most important things that, Smith's talk, that Smith talks about in this book, The Wealth of Nations, is private property rights. And at the time, at the end of the American Revolution, Benjamin Franklin had the opportunity to meet with Adam Smith in France. And the conclusion of, of Adam Smith was that based on what the colonies were trying to do with their constitution, with limiting the government and focusing on individual rights, and specifically property rights, that the United States had the potential to become the largest economy in the history of the world. Right, and that was uh, Adam Smith's prediction in, in 1780, I've forgotten the year. Right? 1780 something, Benjamin, uh, Benjamin Franklin meets with Adam Smith, and we see today what's happened. The United States did in fact create the largest economy the world has ever seen, and the most amount of wealth the, that the world has ever seen. So this was very important change in the period of history so that we could get to this property rights. So I went back and pulled up some uh, property rights have three basic components. And I thought we would talk a little bit about those and then how each of how these components are, are keys to economic success. The right to exclusive use of property. If you, if you own the property, you decide what you do with it. The king doesn't decide, your neighbor shouldn't decide, uh, although we have homeowners associations sometimes and they get mad at us if we don't do what they want. Uh, I don't live, uh, my, my neighborhood doesn't have a homeowners association, uh, and I picked that on purpose because I didn't want the homeowners people telling me what to do. I'm okay with the neighbors doing what they want. Legal protection against invasion from other individuals who seek to use or abuse the property without the owner's permission. And this is one of the things that the, the founders of the Constitution, the writers of the Constitution, wanted to do. Right? They wanted to limit the government to specific roles. One of the roles that the government had was the enforcer of the law. So when we have laws set in place, we want the government to be kind of an umpire to enforce the rules of the game, so to speak. Right? And then when we decide we want to transfer the property, sell the property, mortgage the property, do anything we want to, we alone have that right because we can do that. Now, these three things give us some keys to economic success. Private owners can gain by using resources in a way that are beneficial to others. You can use the resources for yourself, or you can employ those to operate a business, or you can... Do whatever you want, right? 
if they're beneficial to others, then we might earn profits. Something some people I teach in the College of Business, profits are okay for us to talk about there. Right? Some people outside of the College of Business don't like profits a whole lot. But profits are okay to us. Right? So if we ignore what other people want, then who bears the cost? We do. The property owner does. You know, if a business downtown is behaving in a way that we choose, that, that society doesn't like, they're doing things, let's say that, um, uh, I think Yeti Coolers has, has been in the news recently because of their stance on some certain situations, I think with gun control maybe. There's a lot of people that are, that are very upset with uh, that company because of their stance and they're not going to buy their coolers anymore, right? Yeti decided that they wanted to make a stand. Other people have the right to do what they want to do. Right? They can either support what Yeti's doing or not. And then Yeti bears the burden of that, their decision at the end of the day. Number two, private owners have a strong incentive to care for and properly manage what they own. There's a lot of talk about conservation and proper use of resources. Uh, the World Bank has a report on sustainable forest management uh, that I uh, found when I was preparing for uh, the discussion today. One of the things that private property owners do, they have an incentive to take care of what they own. Because at the end of the day, at some point in the future, they may decide to sell it. Or for whatever, they want to use it for recreation for their children or for the community or for whatever they want. If that property is not cared for, can it be used? It can't be used, right? So, <coughs> private property owners have a very strong incentive to be, to have a careful use of what they do and to conserve resources <coughs> on their property. Because they're the one that, that bear the cost if those resources are not cared for in the proper manner, right? So that's another key to success. Also, that bleeds into number three, pri uh, private owners have an incentive to conserve for the future. So not only is that conservation good for today, it's also important to conserve for the future, for future generations. Uh, we can do those things as, as property owners. And then finally here, private owners have an incentive to lower the chance that their property will cause damage to the property of others. And that gets us back a little bit to the uh, government as having the role of an umpire. If our property harms someone else, then we would, be, we would be legally responsible for that. So we have an incentive, right, through the law to maintain proper conditions on our property so that we can't, so that we're not sued later if somebody would be injured, right? We've done all that we can. All of these keys, none of, none of these keys to economic development existed prior to the American Revolution. So we have this great experiment that is continuing today that we're all here to talk about. Here, here's where I put the, uh, the inventors. Of course, we all, Eli Whitney, Morris, and Thomas Edison. You know, those are just three examples that I, that I found fairly quickly. Uh, we could talk about others. Uh, modern day, we would say uh, AT&T probably uh, half, the, half the people in here have an Apple device of some kind or another. So Steve Jobs is a very important inventor. How did he do the things that he did? He was able to develop. He had the rights to sell his inventions. Something that had never existed before. When you invented something in the past, it belonged to the king. You got no benefit from spending your own resources. And when you, had, when you spent your own resources and you, the, the results were stolen from you, how many people invented things? Some inventions were done, but not very many. Not very many. How about poorly defined property rights? I've got a couple of examples here. In some instances, um, people um, will argue that the government is the only way to properly conserve, whether it be timber property or wetlands or uh, rhinos in Africa or whatever that might be. Uh, Private property owners, based on these keys of the owners being able to conserve their own resources, in many cases, private property owners do a better job, uh, I would say in many cases, 
My specialty is government econ, government economics. I would say the government never does a better job than private property owners. That, that's my opinion for all the study and research that I've done. If we want to do true conservation, it's going to come from private citizens owning property. The, I put a picture of a rhino up for an example in South Africa. Uh, rhinos are, it's illegal to hunt rhinos because they're on the endangered species list. In uh, Nambia, right, so the government controls everything in South Africa. When they passed a law in 1999 that made trading of uh, horns illegal, the year before the law was passed, there were 82 illegal killings of rhinos in South Africa. Then the law was passed, there was almost 2,000 in one year's time. Because the government was supposed to be in control, now can the government be out there everywhere all the time? You know, just about today, they're, they're, getting, they're getting there. Right? But in, in Nambia, instead of the government protecting the rhinos, you can own rhinos. You can purchase a rhino that lives close to the, the, the place where you live. And then who's in charge of, of monitoring to make sure that rhino is doing well? You are. You've made an investment into the rhino. Do you go out and check on it? Make sure it has plenty of food to eat? That's what they see happening. The, the, the rhino populations in Nambia are growing. Whereas in South Africa, at least in the early parts of the 2000s, they were, those were, were declining. Now, South Africa, since uh, 2000, they have relaxed their rules somewhat and allowed private ownership of uh, rhinos in South Africa as well. And oddly enough, what's happening in South Africa? Rhino population is growing in South Africa just as it did in Nambia because of the same reason, because these private property owners have an incentive to care for the property that they own. But property rights are not well defined. We have things like happened in South Africa. We call it the tragedy of the commons problem. Right? Who, who takes care of the rhino that nobody owns? Well, somebody else will take care of it. I'm busy today. Well, I'm still busy next week and somebody else is going to take care of it. Right? Barry College tried purchasing bikes for their students to use while on campus. Right? Public transportation provided by the Student Government Association at Barry College. Again, I'm not sure how well this bike, this picture shows up in this room, but this bike is is destroyed. The wheels are bent, the chain is broken, uh, the whole picture of the seat is not even there. And this all happened. All the bikes that they bought at Barry College within one month were completely destroyed. Now they still have a bike program at Barry College, but they had to alter the way the program was run because the property rights were poorly defined and nobody really cared what happened to them. So what happened? They were all destroyed. They altered the property rights and made those things definable. And because they were definable, now they have a, uh, a, a successful public transportation for students where they can ride bicycles across campus. So even small changes in property rights make a big difference. I'm going to do it on time. It's time now. Okay. Sorry, I wasn't watching the cues. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Brawl. We appreciate it.